So we've kind of talked about how data is used in an AI pipeline, where it lives. We've talked about optimizing for TCO. Now let's talk just briefly about specific Solidime products and what we recommend and what we see as our kind of unique value proposition in the market. You'll see some familiar things on this slide at the top. Uh, recalling back to earlier in the presentation when we talked about the various places uh, data lives and how it moves around and then right below it, sort of the, the phases of the pipeline associated uh, with those localities. Uh, this is where we can now start to make uh, sort of informed decisions about uh, uh, storage architecture and, and uh, picking the right products. And so you notice there's kind of a blue box and there's a bathtub shaped purple box around it. I'll explain why that is, but um, at a high level, if you're maximizing um, your, your density and you want to do that in the most power efficient way possible, uh, there's no better choice than, than high density QLC SSDs for all the great reasons uh, Munzor just talked about. Today, that's 61 terabytes is our, our densest U.2 uh, SSD. Uh, uh, coming very soon, uh, announced at uh, FMS, we're going to double that, right? Uh, and so you'll start to see 122 terabytes, you know, that fit in the palm of your hand quite quickly here. Um, and uh, and the reality is we are making gen over gen improvements to density in a way that hard drives just are not, right? And so that disparity will continue to grow over time. So in the way this particular look at our product advocacy is structured, we think that's a no-brainer for the beginning and the end of the pipeline. For the ingest, where you're pulling in lots and lots of raw unstructured data in the archive at the end when you're saving everything and you just have massive uh, uh, quantities of, of data, um, that's, a, that's a fairly obvious recommendation. In the middle of the pipeline, you have options, right? And so this blue box gets a little more complicated and it really depends on a customer's objectives, uh, and the, the, the Solidine product portfolio is built such that customers can make choices to optimize for, for different goals uh, as they're doing AI work. And so we recently announced uh, our flagship Gen 5 TLC SSD, uh, which we call the, the D7 PS1010, say that 10 times fast, mm -hmm. or the D7 PS1010. 30, which is the higher endurance version of the same drive. Uh, that's our performance leader. That's like 14 and a half gigabytes per second sequential read. Uh, uh, it's got screaming random performance as well. And so if the objective is, you know, performance over all else, we want to keep our GPUs maximally utilized. And that is the, the thing that we're optimizing for. Um, that's a natural recommendation. We would say go Gen 5, go with the, the performance leader, uh, obviously. Uh, but we have also um, uh, products in the portfolio. The 5520 is our performance leader TLC drive for Gen 4 systems. The 5430 is a QLC drive uh, with uh, uh, kind of an improved mixed read-write performance portfolio. So any of these are feasible for uh, the direct attached storage as well that lives in the GPU servers, right? Um, you could also take the route of why, why the purple uh, structure is a bathtub. If you want to just maximize for density across the whole pipeline, you could do worse than just putting high density QLC everywhere, right? It's still got uh, uh, read throughput that's on par with TLC drives. We're talking seven gigs a second uh, sequential read. And so the right performance is obviously um, uh, relatively less than the TLC drives that we offer. But um, we feel like the, the portfolio is in good shape today for what our customers are coming to us and asking for. And, and whether it's Gen 5 or 4, whether it's a power uh, thing that's keeping them awake at night or, or GPU utilization, right? As long as you understand what the data is doing and the predominant IO types uh, that are uh, kind of driving um, performance at each stage along the way, you can have a meaningful conversation with a customer and you can say this drive is, is the best because we've understood your workload and we have a variety of different uh, options for you to choose from. This is uh, just one more quick look, uh, like click down on the Gen 5 device. I wanted to share this one because that device is still very new. You may not have seen this before. 
um, but we're quite proud of the performance here. And these numbers, uh, it's performance on the left, efficiency on the right. We're talking about the PS1010 here, which is the Gen 5 uh, performance leader. And the, all these numbers are relative to a competitor's flagship Gen 5 TLC performance SSD as well. So we're comparing apples to apples here, right? We're not talking about Gen 5 TLC versus hard drives. Those are two different places that you're going to use storage in your, in your architecture. But apples to apples, uh, we're quite proud of the performance of this device. Uh, in some of the workloads that we've looked at, whether it's data prep, training, checkpointing, et cetera, we're seeing results that speak for themselves. We're seeing a drive that outperforms uh, competitors and then does it at efficiency, right? That's what the spider chart on the right hand is about. And so we ran a whole bunch of different workloads through them at the drive, different Q depths, different read write mixes, different transfer sizes. Uh, and the, the outer purple ring that you see on that spider chart is the uh, all the the results normalized to a value of one for our ps1010 drive and then all the wiggly lines you see in between are the relatively lower efficiency uh, results from a couple of competitor tlc performance ssds and so it's not just about as going about as going as fast as you can although we're quite thrilled that our customers can do that with our gen 5 devices but it's also about doing it and, and consuming less energy in the course of those ai workloads uh, some of you, if you're uh, uh, geeking out on AI performance, may be familiar with ML Commons. This is an organization that publishes uh, a suite of benchmarks called ML Perf, and uh, they're kind of standardized. Lots of great industry input from ecosystem members about how these things are constructed. There is a working group that focuses on storage benchmarking, and they recently published version 1.0 of the ML Perf storage benchmark. So we ran that in house. Uh, and wanted to share the results with you on that. So what the, the drive that we're looking at, bless you, the drive that we're looking at here is the high density QLC, right? We can share um, the Gen 5 performance face melter, you know, at a later date, that testing is ongoing. But even when we're talking about the density optimized devices, the devices are, or excuse me, the results are quite striking. So uh, the purple bars that you see on this chart represent uh, the results of the test and the way the test works is it, it's a training test for the ML Perf storage uh, for now. They're working on building out other parts of the pipeline. But in, in, at the training stage, uh, looking in this case at a single storage device, a single 60 terabyte QLC SSD, how many GPUs can that storage device keep fed with data so that the GPUs are utilized at a rate of at least 90% over the duration of the test. So if you're, if you're doing that, if you're getting a result of one, for example, your storage device did a great job of feeding one GPU. And you can configure, you see results here for A100 and H100. Um, you can configure which GPUs you wanna measure, but uh, what these results indicate for the purple lines is the high density QLC single device kept four NVIDIA A100 GPUs highly utilized in the course of a training run, kept two H100s utilized, which are obviously higher performance parts. The gray bars indicate recently published results from one of our competitors. Um, they wrote a great white paper and, and um, they make a good product. Uh, but in terms of this test, uh, happy to report we're seeing uh, better performance on our density op optimized uh, QLC SSDs than our competitors have recently published on the same test. Any questions on what that test means or what those results mean? It's not exactly a score or a rate of speed, right? It's a little bit of a different reporting metric. So why, okay, so you got a QLC here versus a TLC is a higher performer than typical QLCs, right? right. What about your design of your QLC is getting you that higher performance? So multiple things. One is our ASIC uh, is designed so that it can transfer the data more efficiently. So when we are designing the ASIC, we take into consideration what is our target performance and everything. And at the same time, our NAND performance improvement is done for, with some of the decoding in the NAND um, uh, area that is efficiently done. So incorporating both these two, basically the engineering design is more, um, Catered towards the QLC when we want to achieve much more performance uh, from the QLC drives. Okay. 
Thank you, Manzar. So one question related to that is, if, if you are saturating your PCI bus and, and your competitor is also saturating that, uh, even with difference of implementation and ASIC and all those things, ultimately both the devices are saturating and should not see the performance difference, right? Right. So, so this difference can only come into picture if the other competitor is not saturating the PCI bus. That is true. Um, but at the same time, like when we are looking at the random performance, then we cannot saturate the, the bus. So in that case, random performance plays an important role. When you are looking at the sequential, yes, if it is saturated, that's the max you can get. Uh, but for random, because the workload is a mixed workload. So in that case, we can see some improvement. Um, with okay, so what, what you're saying is that for random, when the bus is not getting saturated, saturated, that's when the device's characteristics and implementation will come into more picture. More picture, yes. Okay, got it. Good question. You can also saturate the bus by having lower latency response. So, I mean, you, you can be using all the available throughput, but the latency of the device could be higher. Right. Okay, I promised the London Zoo story, uh, so I want to kind of close on this one because I think this is a fun, uh, fun customer deployment with a kind of a human interest element. So the, the Zoological Society of London is uh, is an organization that is every bit as cool as its name suggests, and uh, they're doing some cool work uh, to uh, uh, conserve and protect urban hedgehogs in London. So this is a, this is a population that's in danger because these groups of hedgehogs within you know the human environment tend to be uh, disconnected from one another and that leads to genetic problems because you get a lot of inbreeding in these small pockets of hedgehog population uh, they know what they want to do about this right they want to create green corridors which connect the populations together and allow them to intermingle they want to uh, supplement the population if needed with genetically diverse, you know, individuals, introduce them to help kind of resolve this. Uh, but in order to do that, they need to understand, sort of quantify and assess the, the, the problem to begin with. And so that's where they have teamed up with, with one of our partners, Peak AIO, and with us, uh, and, uh, and done some pretty cool work over there. So they've got this network of cameras. Uh, and they're generating millions and millions of images. They're motion-activated cameras. That's every time a person walks by, a car draw, walks by or drives by, the wind blows too hard, right? Uh, these things are, are capturing all of that. That's obviously way more data than they want to uh, actually analyze. And so uh, they take that, uh, that mass of raw data, they go through the pre-processing stage, uh, and they filter out the humans, the objects. They draw bounding boxes, which you can kind of see in the top right on that image. Uh, around uh, where the images are or where the animals are in the image and then they can feed that into an AI model and they can use that model to classify what species are we talking about and start to build a picture of the abundance of the animal in the environment and the, and the distribution geographically right and they're they're looking at doing this for all sorts of uh, different species but the hedgehog is kind of the the, the tip of the spear here uh, and so uh, what they've done is they have built an edge data center uh, at the zoo. That's a picture of the actual um, rack. Uh, it used to be a seldom used reception area in the zoo, and they repurposed it. Uh, and uh, what's in their rack is two DGX H100 servers, a bunch of compute, right? And then they've got two of these peak AIO servers full of SolidIM 61 terabyte QLC SSDs. Uh, and that enables them to churn through process, pre-process, and then, and then run inference on these images more quickly uh, than, than they ever were in the past. Um, side note, I thought it was kind of fun from this article. They, the, the, the facility that they built this edge data center and that used to be like a reception room that nobody used, when they started converting it, they had to uh, attach a big chiller to the outside of the building to cool the the data center infrastructure. And, and uh, they realized that this facility was right next to the pen where they're keeping the Chinese water deer. And they realized that this installation of the chiller was very disruptive to the, to the Chinese water deer. And so they had to 
accommodate for that. And they had to move the animals so they could finish the, the construction and bring the animals back. And it may be the only data center in the world that's been built with Chinese uh, water deer uh, concerns in mind. They may have a claim to that. So uh, a handful of questions. Uh, <laughs> if they're about water deer, I don't have uh, No, no, questions. but I mean, it's, uh, you know, rather than having a water chiller, why don't you use that water to, uh, that heat, to heat like a tropical <laughs> fish exhibit? That's a great question. I don't have an answer to that one either. Uh, a question, and you might not know the answer to this, are they actually doing any effort to do individual animal recognition so they can track them around? Today, it's about population assessment. Uh, it's not about identifying individuals or tracking their habits over time, right? You could see the application of that with an approach like this, but really now it's about on a on a mass scale, understanding how many are in this population, where are they, uh, so that they can start to make strategic choices for conservation. And this might be your next slide, but do you actually have a, a TCO analysis on this? I don't have a TCO analysis. No, I have a before and after kind of performance bit of feedback from uh, one of the professors at the Zoological Society. This is the feedback he gave us on sort of the pre-processing speed, but in terms of energy consumption, it's a great question. It's one we can we can go track down if you're interested in the answer. Okay, well, I mean, it, it's, you spend an awful lot of your discussion going into the TCO aspect of it, yeah. so it'd be kind of cool to show both the performance and the, the cost benefits. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I was just gonna, just gonna say, you've done an excellent job of comparing apples with apples all the way through, and just with the pre-processing speed, we've just gone to three per minute to 30 per second, and. Yeah. A little bit behind that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Message uh, received. Understood. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. Um, this is a little bit of wrap up here. Learn more. We have an AI uh, landing page on the website. Uh, certainly encourage you to check that out. It's updated all the time with uh, new blog posts and videos and stuff like that. Um, and the, the note I will leave you on is uh, I hope we've established AI requires a ton of data. Data obviously requires infrastructure. Efficiency is going to be the key constraint to building out that infrastructure in the years to come. Uh, and with our uh, density advantage, with the other um, aspects of the product portfolio we've talked about, Solidime can deliver there in a way that, uh, that no other company can uh, when it comes to data infrastructure. Thank you very much. A big uh, six-fingered uh, thumbs up to all of you for your, your... <laughs> We really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Is there any development at SEM? Yeah, uh, I mean, we don't have anything um, to disclose today other than the TLC and QLC products in the, in the portfolio. There, there's certainly, we're still hearing from the market and from customers, um, even folks who continue to use Optane, right? I think Vast is built on a bunch mm -hmm. of QLC yep. with Optane caching. And so certainly there's still interest in, uh, it's, it's a promising, in the, in the memory tiering hierarchy, it feels like a gap now. There's promising technologies to fill it, but that's, okay. 